Kelly, Atomic Heritage Foundation. It is Wednesday, April 25th, 2018, and I have with me Julie Ezel, and I would like, first question, is to have Julie tell us her name and spell it. Julie Ezold, E-Z-O-L-D. Great. Thank you, Julie. All right. My question is, first we want to learn something about you uh, and where you're from and something about your childhood or what, what gets you started in wanting to become a scientist. Well, I grew up in upstate New York, a small town called Ballston Lake. We had three acres of land, so we were pretty rural. But at that time, the state of New York and state of California were having a public education war, so the students won. So I had a really great opportunity. I had some very good teachers, and my sixth grade science teacher was the one who really got me interested in science. I can still remember his lessons. Uh, I was also good in math, so they started segregating you in sixth grade so that you could be accelerated math so that you would be taking the advanced placement classes by your senior year. So I was already on that track by the time I was 11. Uh, my father, I had an older sister, I had two younger brothers, and my dad was very adamant about you will all get a good college education, you will have employment. So there was no, this is a girl thing, this is a boy thing, there was you will do, period. So that made it pretty easy that way. The summer before your senior year, you get bombarded with where to go for college. I got this uh, opportunity to do a summer one-week camp in Lynchburg College in Lynchburg, Virginia, and you could pick a topic. One topic was nuclear chemistry. I was going to do advanced placement chemistry anyways. This sounded like a good opportunity. My parents agreed to pack up the camper, and we drove 13 hours south, so from upstate New York to southwestern Virginia. I spent a week, we were the only class that had um, lab work. So we got to not only learn about radioactivity, nuclear chemistry, radio chemistry, we also got to do the labs that went with it. So as soon as my dad picked me up from that camp, I was like, I'm gonna be a nuclear engineer. And he's like, okay, kid. But at that time, there were only 13 accredited programs in the nation. So it very much limited where I was going to go to school. That meant I was going to his alma mater. I was going to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. It was the closest one to where we lived. The next one would have been uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So, but unfortunately with four kids and my dad being a state worker, a four year private education was not quite gonna be in the works. But they had a community college down the road. So I went two years for my community college, same coursework, and could directly transfer into Rensselaer my junior year. So my degree still says Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And at that point you have to decide, is it graduate school or is it work? And so I had two job offers and I had two graduate school offers and I really wanted to continue. So I went to North Carolina State and did my research there, but then I had the opportunity as a Department of Energy fellow to actually come here to Oak Ridge National Laboratory and use the high flux isotope reactor for my research back doing radiochemistry. So, 26 years later, I'm still working next to the high flux isotope reactor doing radiochemistry. <laughs> All right, we want to pick up, ah, 26 years later. Yes. <laughs> and you're still here. I am still here. That's great. Well, tell us about your work. So my current position? Uh, or any of them? <laughs> you know, how, more generally, I mean, yeah, sure. You might want to talk about what you started working on, how this has evolved in the 26 years you've been here. So I started in radioactive waste management, did environmental restoration, did criticality, safety, and enriched uranium operations at the Y-12 National Security Complex, then came back to Oak Ridge National Lab, did oversight assessments where I got to see a broad view of how the National Lab works, and then got placed where I am today at the Radiochemical Engineering Development Center, and I've been there for 14 years. So to tell us about what you're doing in the last 14 years, then we'll focus here. Okay. So I'm responsible for the Californium-252 program. So Californium-252 is a unique isotope. It's a man-made isotope, and it can only be made in measurable quantities in two places in the world. It's either here at Oak Ridge National Laboratory or in Dimitrograd, Russia. And what makes it unique is that when it decays, it has a two and a half year half-life. And when it radioactive decays, it spontaneous fissions 3% of the time and gives off neutrons. And that, so it's a portable neutron source. Doesn't need any electronics, it's always going to work. 
and that neutron source can be used to start up new uh, nuclear power plants or ones that have been shut down for a significant amount of time. It's also used for the uranium fuel rods that go into those nuclear power plants. It can do radiography to look for uniformity of the uranium-235 in the rods. But more importantly, it's used in analyzers, coal, cement, and mineral analyzers. They'll use two small neutron sources on either side of the conveyor belt, and literally, as the material is either coming out of the ground or being processed, they know the impurities of what's in that material so they can make the processing de decisions online. So in order to make the Californium-252, we have to start with elements before that. So in your chemistry book, there's a periodic table. And the very bottom row of your periodic table is what's called the actinide series. They're special. They're all by themselves. And so it starts with uranium and goes onward. So curium is element number 96. Berkelium is element 97. Californium is element 98. So those are your elements, and the numbers mean the number of protons. Isotopes are the same element, but have different numbers of neutrons. So there's still an element, still. So Californium has isotopes of 249, 250, 251, and then the one I would make is 252. It just means there's more neutrons inside that nucleus. So the element stays the same, but the properties of the isotope are very different. So with element or with isotope Californium 252, with all those extra neutrons, and when it decides it's de going to decay, it's got too much energy, it says, you know what, I need to split, literally, 3% of the time, it splits apart and gives off some of those neutrons. Those neutrons then can be used for these other applications. We can use neutrons to interrogate material, just like x-rays. So they can use the neutrons, go in and see an image, if you want to think of it that way. Or these neutrons can activate, make excited any of those impurities for the analyzers. When those impurities get excited, they have to give off energy, and most of the time their energy comes off in the form of gamma rays, again, like X-rays. Those gamma rays come off at a certain energy. The detectors know that energy, and so they can tell the engineers or scientists, oh, based on that energy, I know it's this type of impurity. And that tells the operators then what to do. But going back to how we make it, we have to start with the curium isotopes, which were again man-made, everything's man-made past uranium. We then have to do this in remote hot cells. And our hot cell facilities are 54 inch thick, high density concrete with leaded glass, and we use these really cool robotic arms. They're called manipulators, but just think like the claw. That's what we use to do all the work behind those windows. We press pellets, they're about this big. We load them into a tube, we seal it up with welding it, and then we send it over to the high flux isotope reactor. And it's that high flux meaning lots of neutrons. And if you can imp imagine this number of 2.5 times 10 to the 15 neutrons per centimeter squared, per second. So a lot of neutrons in a very small area in one second. We need that in order to push the curium isotopes to make the californium. And we have to leave them in the reactor for four cycles, which is about four months. So it takes that long. I'm not going to figure out how many hours to seconds that is and how many neutrons. It's a lot. But that's why it can only be made in two places in the world. You have to have the starting material, and you have to have that extreme high flux reactor. And there's only two of them in the world that can do that. And once we irradiate those targets for that length of time, we bring them back to the hot cell facilities, and now we get to do the fun stuff. All that chemistry you got to do in high school, we do it even more exciting because we're doing it again in those hot cells, and we can actually separate elements through chemistry. Can't separate the isotopes, but we can separate the different elements from each other and get just the ones we want. And, and that happens in the Radiochemical Engineering? Development Center. Mm -hmm. Development Center. So how does that work? That facility just celebrated its 50th anniversary uh, two years ago. It went operational in 1966. Last year it was recognized by the American Nuclear Society as a historical landmark. We'll be celebrating that next month. 
So to me, it's fascinating that you have a facility that's 50 plus years old. It was designed and built with no calculators, no computers, slide rules. And when I take students, especially through tours, I tell them you need to go look up what a slide rule is to understand how to do the calculations that built this facility that we still use today to do world-class research to make isotopes like Californium-252 and the Plutonium-238 for NASA's deep space missions. So it, to me, it, that's a fascinating uh, part of our facility. But it's still operational. It was built very well. It was designed very well. We have amazing staff who can operate it and maintain it, and incredible engineers and scientists who know how to use that facility. So I'm familiar with the um, calutrons, and they were operating until 1998 with 83 calutron to produce you know, 200 different kinds of isotopes. So how does that differ from what's so going on So they today? would have had multiple isotopes of the same element, and they would have separated isotopes. So that was a technology that was used to separate isotopes, because again, isotopes has the same number of protons, it just differs by the number of neutrons. Chemically, it's the same. So if what we do in the Radiochemical Engineering Development Center is we can separate elements by chemistry. We cannot separate isotopes. So ours is a very different from the calutron and the capabilities. So we bring our material back. We're separating the curium that we started with because we don't use it all up. On the way to making Californium, we're going to make Berkelium, which we'll talk about the Berkelium 249 and how it was used for discovery of a new element. And then we make the Californium. Well, it keeps going. We can actually make Einsteinium. And back in the 70s and 80s, we even went further. We went to Fermium. We went to element 100. So we would separate the elements and the isotopes that were generated from those reactions, but not separate isotopes themselves. So do you, um, should we go back to the, um, is it 249? The Berkelium? Yes, tell us about that. So since it's a different element, it has 97 protons versus the 98 of California 252, we can elementally separate it, again, in the hot cells. Berkelium is unique because when it radioactive decays, it gives off 99.99% of the time beta particles. And the way to think of a beta particle is a very fast electron very tiny, very fast, not as energetic as a gamma ray, but still an energy level. But the researchers didn't worry about that. They wanted it because it was 97. They were looking for element 117, and they were gonna use a beam of calcium ions, and calcium is element 20. So to get to 117, you need 97 plus 20, and that's how they were doing it. Again, only two places in the world that can do it, so they knew we were getting ready to do a Californium 252 production run. They knew we made Berkelium along the way. We can separate it. So when we did that, we separated out roughly about 22 milligrams of the Berkelium 249 in the hot cell. We were able to purify it to just like half of a microgram of Californium. We took it up to our glove box labs so instead of having used mechanical arms, your glove box labs now don't have as much shielding because you don't need it from a radioactive point of view, and you actually put your hands into these big gloves, so you have more dexterity to do the work. So they purify, ultra-purified it. We got it below detectable limits for California, so a very pure product went to uh, Dimitrograd, Russia, and where they took that material and made the target wheels. And if you could just think of a spinning wheel with these little foils on it, and they painted the Berkelium material onto those uh, foils. That wheel was then sent to Dubna, to the Joint Institute of Nuclear Research, and that's where the accelerator was that had the calcium-48 ions. So they accelerated those ions, and then you had that target wheel spinning, and the ions just kept hitting it, and hitting it, and hitting it for 150 days, and they used about three grams of calcium to do this. And I thought about doing this last night to try to figure out how many atoms it was, but it really got hard, and it's, it's like 10 to the 20, it's a lot of atoms. But it took them 150 days, and of that, only six atoms of one element 117 were detected. 
So when you're talking about 10 to the 20 atoms total and only six became the new element, it's fascinating. And the way they could determine they had a discovery was they had a detector system. And so knowing that these new elements have very short half-lives on the order of microseconds, they decay into known elements. And that's what you're looking for, is it to decay into something you've already seen before by the energy that it gives off. And so that was how they came up with the six. It's astounding. Well, then we had to do it again two more years later. Oh, it's amazing. And you were telling me this is, this is then used in outer space exploration? No. Oh. So the new element really has no application at this time. Most of those new elements don't because they're such short-lived. Even the ones that are, have a few seconds still are short-lived. But the thing to remember was back in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, when Glenn Seaborg was discovering new elements, they discovered americium. And the first isotopes of americium were very short-lived, and they didn't know what to do with them. But do you have a smoke detector in your house? Yes. yes. If you open up your smoke detector, if it's an older style, you'll see a silver disc in there and it will have the stamping on it AM-241 and the radioactive tree foil. So it uses americium-241, a unique isotope of the americium that gives off alpha particles. And the way your smoke detector work, it works is that americium is always giving off these little alpha particles that can't travel very far, can't even travel through your skin. And the detector is so close that it's always seeing them. And as long as the detector can always see those alpha particles, it says the air is clear. It's all good. But as soon as smoke gets in the way, the alpha particles can't go through it. And that's why it alarms. But that's also why it alarms when it's in your bathroom and the steam comes out. The alpha particles can't get through the water molecules. So that's why you're always there fanning it. That's why, it's to clear the air so that the, the detector can see the alpha particles from the americium source. So we don't know where this can go in the future. If we can make these new elements, isotopes of these new elements that would last longer, we don't know what they could do. That's the exciting part. Wow. So your, your work involves I mean, probably a whole team of people, <laughs> some of whom work on the production side, trying to create these elements, um, and others are working on application sides, or what? Predominantly what here, we're going to be just making the um, isotopes and the elements. Uh, applications like for Californium-252, that's an industrial isotope, so industry is going to do that for the most part. Now, researchers may use very small Californium sources to do research because they want those neutrons and they want them of a certain energy that the Californium-252 will decay with. Mm -hmm. So they'll use them with research. Uh, as I said, the, then the new elements, well, we're still trying to make berkelium targets, Einsteinium targets. The goal now is to push beyond element 117 and 118. They're pushing on towards now for 119, 120, and the real key is element 121, whether it will be a transitional metal or if it will be a whole new series below actinides. So the chemists, that's what they're really curious about. The physicists just want to keep jamming things together and see what happens. <laughs> so the chemists and the physicists have very different views on this. Isn't that interesting? So the chemists, what is their goal? They are looking to see the chemical properties to see if the periodic table is correct. You know, we almost take the periodic table for granted. But as you get into these higher uh, elements, you have effects, the relative, relativistic effects, the quantum effects that Einstein predicted. So we don't know how that affects the chemistry. So as you're trying to put more of these electrons together in those outer shells and cram more neutrons and protons together in the nucleus, we don't know what's really going on there. So that's kind of a combination of chemistry and physics of what's going on. But the chemist's point of view is, what happens next? Is it, is it a transitional metal, you know, the bulk of the middle of the table, or do we get a whole new series, something completely new? And when you think about it, Seabor came up with the actinide series, again, it was only in the 1950s. It wasn't really that long ago. So the fact that we could be on the cusp of doing that again within, you know, 65 years, it's pretty cool. <laughs> it is. 
It is cool. Now, you were saying some of these um, have a very, very short lifespan of seconds, even. Microseconds or less. Microseconds. And I guess a new, a new element, tennessean. Tennessean? <laughs> yes, yes. So tell us about that. So that one falls in the same column as the periodic table as fluorine, chlorine, uh, iodine, astatine. That's why it had to end in the I-N-E. That's why it can't be the I-U-M that we all want it to be. It has to be tennessine. So in theory, by the periodic table, it should have similar characteristics. So if we could create one that would be more stable than a few microseconds, that we could actually do some chemistry on it, we could tell does it fit in that line? But that's what it should do. So how do you go about making an isotope behave and stay around? Be more stable? Yeah, be more stable. It needs more neutrons. <laughs> if you were still gonna do berkelium and calcium, those two combinations, one of them would have to have more neutrons in it, and that's not gonna really work. So the thing would be to look at a different beam and a different target and see if you could push more neutrons through those isotopes. And it's a challenge because you want to find the ones that are going to react together. And that, that's the challenge that they're having right now is trying to come up with that combination of the ion beam, that which is coming at it, and the target that's being hit. So we're into physics now, and that's beyond my capability. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, I understand the basics, and that's about it. But that's what they're trying to figure out is those correct combinations so that we can make things last longer. That was another one of Glenn Seaborg's uh, theories, was this idea of an island of stability, that once you got past uranium, then you were doing these man-made and they were all pretty much unstable, but he believed there was some magic combination of neutrons and protons, and if you could find that, then those elements, those isotopes, would be stable. So that's what we're shooting for, is that island. <laughs> <laughs> so his theory has it been proven in part? That's what they're working on today. So you have uh, element 118 was discovered at the, and accepted the same time as uh, 113, 15, 17, and 18. They were all accepted in the same time frame. So 118, we are working with the Russians to supply uh, an a isotope called Californium-251, and they're trying to put, put that in their beam with the calcium. and. That way, they did the original experiment with Californium-249. So Californium-251 has two more neutrons, more neutrons. So the idea is if you could take that and compare whatever new element 118 isotopes come out of that experiment, that half-life should be longer than the first set of isotopes when they use the Californium-249 target. So that's the current experiment that's being worked today. So we'll see. <laughs> My goodness. Um, let's see, there's another note here that, that um, you're working on reestablishing DOE's capability to produce T38 for space missions. That's the, yeah, the, the plutonium-238 program, right. So the domestic supply stopped in about the late 1990s. And then the United States was getting its plutonium-238 from the Russians, and they, in turn, have stopped supplying. So in order to continue with the deep space mission, somebody needs to make the plutonium-238. So it's a combination of the, of the laboratories. It's uh, Idaho National Laboratory, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and Los Alamos National Laboratory. Right now, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is making the targets using the uh, isotope ne neptunium-237. And luckily, neptunium, to plutonium, there's only one jump. <laughs> so it's a little bit easier to do. But they make those targets, they put them again in the high flux isotope reactor, irradiate them for about two cycles, bring them back, and then separate the neptunium from the plutonium. And then the plutonium is converted to an oxide. And that oxide is then in turn shipped to Los Alamos, where they will then make it into um, these kind of like nuggets, is the best way I can explain it. And then it goes to Idaho, and Idaho will actually make the uh, RTGs, which are the radio thermo generators, something like that. But that's the power source, and that's the power source that was used on Voyager, the Curiosity rover. So anything that's in our near orbit or up to about Mars, 
they can usually use the solar panels to get enough power to do the instrumentation, but once you go beyond that, you just can't get enough energy from the solar. So you need this um, plutonium-238 source when it decays, gives off heat, and they can then convert the heat to electrical power, and that's what powers the instrumentations. So how long, I mean, I know they, they keep, that's NASA and, and, and now private uh, concerns are, are launching space probes and the like, and, and, and are talking about it. How many years would the plutonium-238 be able to keep generating uh, the heat for electricity? I believe its half-life is on the order of 88 years. I'd have to double check that for sure, because that's outside my program. So you figure every 88 years, half of the material decays away. So Voyager's been out there 30, 40 years, <laughs> it's not even a half-life yet, and it's still going. I mean, it went beyond our solar system a couple of years ago, and it's still going, so it's pretty impressive. So at least a half-life, if not more. <laughs> but again, we don't know, because Voyager's our oldest one, and it's only been out for about 40 or 50 years. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, so there's... Another note here that all of these things are are helping research on medical devices and prosthesis using gamma radiation to sterilize and improve the wear characteristics of polyethylene. Is that? That is, again, we're getting into gammas. That's not really uh, my area. My area is going to be more isotope production. Now, there are medical isotopes that within my organization are responsible for our doing, such as the actinium-225, which is a decay product from thorium-229, and that's being used as a palliative treatment with prostate cancer, and it's actually, the FDA has approved that one. And we also do some other medical isotope works with lutetium, um, and tungsten, I'm trying to think of a couple of the others. So there's other work that Oak Ridge National Lab is doing with developing isotopes. Uh, a couple of them are what we call targeted alpha therapy. So the isotopes, when they go through their half-life, emit those alpha particles, like the americium. Alpha particle is just like a helium nucleus, two neutrons and two protons. So relatively speaking, we think it's a big thing. And it has a, packs a wallop. It has a lot of energy in it. And the idea is if you could attach the um, isotope to a protein or an enzyme that would go to the cancer tumor, go through and attach itself, it would literally just start bombing that tumor from the outside and work its way in with minimal damage to anything around it. So I equate it to a smart bomb. So it's directly going to that tumor and it's attacking the tumor and making it smaller and smaller. And the initial results from the trials is absolutely amazing. One to two treatments and the tumors are eradicated. So it's just that area of opportunity is, is boundless. I can't, I'm really hoping to see leaps and bounds in that area. Well, I would say so. So this is uh, what you're describing is one particular isotope. It's that one particular one is actinium-225, but there are other alpha-emitting isotopes that are being uh, looked at and researched for that same type of application. So it's a, a therapy called targeted alpha uh, therapy. So and the Europeans are doing a lot of research on it as well, but you need the isotopes in order to do the research. Well, I've heard of um, the use of, I guess you call them seeds for prostate cancer, mm -hmm. is that? Yeah. That's a little different because that's actually putting something in you as opposed to this is attaching, as I said, I don't remember if it's an enzyme or a protein, Biology was not my strong suit either, but it would go right to the tumor. So as opposed to trying to implant something that you might have to take out, the, uh, the uh, isotope will decay, 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 and these are relatively short-lived days type of half-lives. So once it's worn itself out, your body eliminates it. Marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously it takes um, multidisciplinary effort um, to translate these into you know, treatment of medical issues such as cancer. Uh, so do people, I mean, and your, you have your expertise mm -hmm. producing these things, so there's got to be a lot of conversation or at least 
collaboration openness between you know the laboratory and these other potential users so that yeah so that's they're working on that so so that right now our focus is ensuring we have a supply of those isotopes but those collaborations are being worked with the entities that would do those actual research uh, you know whether it's trials or animal those are not physically done here at Oak Ridge National Laboratory but with other institutions right. so is um, people that you work with mostly are, are are people like your yourself or you would describe yourself as as what biochemist or chemical I'm actually a nuclear engineer, engineer by training a, a, Mm -hmm. Our staff at the Radiochemical Engineering Development Center is broad. We have chemists, radiochemists, chemical engineers, material engineers, mechanical engineers, I think I got an organic chemist, you name it, we have it up there. And so you have to have that multidisciplinary workforce to do everything that is done up there. Our operations staff, as I said, they're fabulous to work those facilities and keep them running, to run those manipulators and do all the things we need done. So a lot of them are, again, more mechanical base backgrounds. A lot of uh, folks that, who had been in the uh, nuclear Navy program come and work here. So then just the craft that need to keep those manipulators running or any of our other systems running. They truly, when they call them craft, they are craftsmen. They really and truly are to keep those facilities running. So it's a very diverse group and it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a family atmosphere up there. <laughs> so you're saying that working with people with diverse expertise is a lot of fun. Yes. And we, a lot of folks have come from all over as well. So we have, you know, East Coast, West Coast, North, South, international. So you have, like I said, we have a lot of diversity. We're very different <laughs> up there, and we like it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And most of these people just come for two years and stay for 20? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it seems to be. I did the same thing. I've never stayed in any of my past positions for more than three years, and I've been there 14, so yes. <laughs> So what else should I be asking you? What can you tell us about uh, the future? Well, we keep hope and we'll keep going. Um, I, I hope that we will do more in that targeted alpha therapy and coming up with isotopes that can be used for that. I'm hoping that we can make significant quantities of the Einsteinium so that we can push the new super heavy element discovery. That's the one that's going to be very difficult. This last time that we made it, we only made one and a half micrograms and they need milligram quantities, so order, you know, order of 10 or a thousand fold more. I don't know how to do that. I got really smart researcher, she's working on that. <laughs> but we've got to figure that out to kind of push that envelope. So we need to figure out a way of how can we make these isotopes that are so unique and so difficult to make, but make them in more quantity so that they can be used for research. So that, that's a challenge. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think what else, just coming up with new techniques. If we could figure out a way to chemically separate isotopes, that would be outstanding. I think that would be tops. <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to happen either, but that would be a... And if the physicists could come up with a way to either lengthen short half-lives you know, short half -lives or shorten ones that we don't like, that would be great too. <laughs> so if we could force the laws of physics to change a little bit, I'd like that. <laughs> But I think overall, it's just the fact that Oak Ridge National Lab did start out as a Manhattan project. But ini almost initially, you had a discovery of promethium, element 61, that had, it was, a, it was a blank spot on the periodic table for a really long time. And in 1945, it was isolated here at Oak Ridge National Lab. That was the first element that we were recognized with discovery of. Then you had Seaborg, Glenn Seaborg's vision to produce transplutonium elements in measurable quantities that led to the high flux isotope reactor and the Radiochemical Engineering Development Center. And then today, we're looking at possibly proving another one of his theories, all in this kind of 75 year span. And to be part of that is just, it's an honor.
I mean, there's other industrial isotopes that we, we produce. Again, the high-flux isotope reactor is a very unique instrument. Um, best as we can tell, it's one of a kind. The Russians have a very similar reactor, but not the capacity that the high-flux isotope reactor has. With that immense amount of neutrons in that small area, uh, they call it the flux, you can do so many amazing things, not just the isotope production, but it can be used to mimic uh, fusion. It can be used to mimic for the extension of the nuclear power plants, the embrittlement of what they will see just because of that hitting of the neutrons over and over and over again. And that's one of the areas we're looking at for welding. So these nuclear power plants that are trying to extend their life beyond 40 years to 60 years to 80 years, they know they'll have embrittlement issues on their pressure vessels. So they know that traditional welding is not going to work if they need to go in and do any repairs. So one of the things that the uh, EPRI, which is, I can't remember what EPRI stands for, but it's a commercial uh, research entity, teamed with Oak Ridge National Lab, and we can take stainless steel coupons that are similar to what the stainless steel that's used in the pressure vessels of the nuclear power plants, irradiate them in the high-flux isotope reactor to mimic 40 years, 60 years, and beyond. They bring them back to our hot cell facilities, and we're using advanced laser techniques, uh, friction stir weld laser, I'm sorry, friction stir welder and laser welders to see if you can weld these materials that have been embrittled by neutrons for so long. So again, it's just the way that we can use our facilities and help in different areas, and something that is as old as we are and still be able to do that. When you think about uh, the welding, the brittle, brittleness that might be happening in our, our long-lived nuclear reactors, it, it, that's an issue that, you know, obviously the, there were many re reactors in the Manhattan Project aren't so many now, but have you been approached by the nuclear industry to do this research? Or Th that's what EPRI is. I was trying to remember what the acronym stands for. I want to say it's the Energy Power Research Institute, but that's what their entity is. It represents the nuclear power um, enterprise. And they approached you. They approached us, so they knew we had the capabilities to do that. So it's really driven by them. It's been written up in the American uh, Nuclear Society and the Nuclear News and other uh, publications supporting the nuclear industry. Yeah, but I was just thinking of the longevity of the nuclear reactors we have today and the future of nuclear energy. I'd like to see the future keep going. I, I told my daughter we were not getting an electric vehicle until Watts Bar Unit 2 came online. Because electric vehicles, yes, they're cleaner, but they must get their power from somewhere. And if you're just going to have more coal or natural gas, then you're still putting the CO2 in the environment. So yes, the vehicle is not, but you had to power it by something that is. And that's the balance. We've got to figure out that balance. So nuclear power is what they call an on-demand. It's always going to be on. It doesn't need the sun. It doesn't need the wind. It's always going to be there. And it should be part of the portfolio because it does not give off any of the carbon dioxide. We know how to safely handle them. We've been doing this for a long time. The hard part is we, as nuclear engineers, we're never very good at communicating, ever. <laughs> we did not break things down to where people could understand and we did not listen to the questions that were being asked. And so, yes, I will blame my own kind. We did not do a very good job of communicating what we knew about them and what we believed about them and be able to say, this is why, as opposed to just trust me, I'm an engineer. So I think that's where you see this new generation with these new designs and these advanced reactor designs and how energetic these 30-year-olds are and 20-something-year-olds are, and they do a much better job going out there and talking to folks and selling their designs of what's going on then they're very passionate about it. So I'm very hopeful, still hopeful. <laughs> but I think we need to look at the new designs and see where we can go with them. And a small modular reactor is really no different than what you see in submarines and aircraft carriers. <laughs> They've been around for a while too. We, again, I have confidence we can do that. That's great. So just looking at you, I realize um, you're a woman, a woman scientist. <laughs>
Yes, ma'am. Were you a pioneer when you first started? Or have you, uh, do you feel um, that, that um, this is a good career for a woman? It's definitely a good career for a woman because like we talked about the diversity and the teamwork you have to have with it. It's, it's very good. You must communicate. And women, I think, do do a better job than that. Sorry, guys. Uh, as far as a pioneer, I don't know because, again, my father just said you're going to college. There was no if, ands, or buts about that in the career path. So I chose something that fascinated me, and that's what I tell all my students that I mentor, is you must choose a career that you're going to enjoy getting up every morning and doing because you will be doing that more than the time you spend with your family. You're at your job more than you are at home, at least waking hours. So you must find something that you're passionate, enthusiastic about. And I was hooked then when I was 16 years old about radioactivity and this nuclear chemistry and how you could do this and see things that weren't really there. So, uh, so I don't know about thinking of as a pioneer as opposed to just do. But yeah, there were not a lot of women. <laughs> But at the REDC, the Radiochemical Engineering Development Center, we do have quite a few uh, researchers and staff members that are, are women. So you don't feel like you're by yourself.